Moving on to the next theory, the social process theories. Some sociologists believe that delinquency is not the result of living in an impoverished, deteriorated, low-class area, but rather the end product of various social processes, especially inappropriate socialization and social learning. This approach stresses the role of interpersonal relationships, the strength of social bond, a lack of self-control, and the personal and group consequences of societal reactions to delinquency. So what's socialization? The process of learning the values and norms of the society or the subculture to which the individual belongs. If the process is incomplete or negatively impacted, it can produce an adolescent with a poor self-image, loss of values, and have effects on behavior, who then can become, what, alienated from conventional uh, social institutions. So those kids who experience improper or lack of uh, socialization They're the ones that are at risk for delinquent behavior and and crime. So what are the major influences on a child's socialization? There's three major ones, family relations, peers, and school. And while we're going to talk a little bit about them in a more general sense right now, each one of these has a particular chapter later on that we'll, we will explore in more detail. So let's talk about family relations. So, so socialization starts in early childhood, right? A child who witnesses uh, stress between parents, marital stress between parents, fighting between parents, um, a child who is subject to verbal Uh, abuse or physical abuse or harsh punishments. uh, If they struggle with uh, a lack of love or warmth or any involvement from parents, all of these have uh, been associated with causing antisocial behavior. Children from dysfunctional homes are more apt to engage in antisocial behavior as well as delinquent behavior and crime and or have stressful adult lives, and they may ultimately even suffer from uh, mental disorders. It's important for parents to establish warm and close relationships with their children. It is also important for them to teach their children to engage in conventional behavior and avoid delinquency. This is what we call the parent efficacy. The research linking delinquency to family relationships is significant, and it's significant regardless of uh, gender, race, and ethnicity. The other factor is school. Research shows a link between poor school performance and delinquency. Uh, Adolescent who thinks they are a failure or not smart enough or that their teacher doesn't care they do poorly, and some ultimately commit, uh, quit school. And when they do that, what happens? They're forced to have to go out into the real world. They have to enter the adult world. They have to get a job, and they do not have any skills. They lack skills to uh, achieve and be successful uh, in that world. The third major factor is peers. Peer groups have a powerful effect on human conduct and can influence decision-making and behavior choices. Like I said, we'll cover peers and delinquency a little bit more later uh, on in the semester. But what effect do peers have? If an adolescent hangs out with friends who engage in antisocial or delinquent behavior, they're more apt to do the same because they want to be like their friends. On the flip side, if friends are pro-social and follow social norms, they're more in line adolescents are more in line to do the same as well. And then there are those who may be more apt to be fearful of punishment. They may want to go along with their friends who commit delinquent behavior, but the fear of being punished, they may not fall in line with those friends. That is strong. And where does that come from? Parents. 
those folks are more apt to be more appropriately socialized from their parents. But more on that topic a little later. So how does socializing influence socialization influence delinquency? How does socialization influence delinquency? Family relationships, school, and peers. These are all elements of socialization that affect delinquency. Sociologists, however, take take these elements and they interpret the association differently. And there's three different views on this. They have a learning theory where criminal delinquent behavior is learned. There's a control theory where criminal delinquent behavior is the result of a lack of control or restraint uh, a delinquent or an adolescent faces labeling theory where the delinquent behavior is the result of one being labeled as such. You're a bad person, you're a delinquent, you're a criminal. They become stigmatized. So these are the three theories that uh, sociologists uh, have associated those elements uh, with. So let's talk the first one. Social learning theories, the differential association. Social learning theory says that all behavior is learned in much the same way that uh, delinquency behavior, like other forms of behavior, is also learned. Adolescents learn to commit crime from others by learning the norms, values, and patterns of behaviors conducive to crime. Therefore, according to the learning theory, delinquent behavior is the product of the social environment and not an innate uh, characteristic. Criminologist Edwin Sutherland developed the differential association theory, which emphasized the role of socialization in the development of delinquent behavior as opposed to mental defects or genetic influences, specifically He claimed that delinquent behavior is learned through communication and interaction with others, peers, family. He further stated that kids learn the techniques of committing crimes as well as the attitudes and uh, rationalizations that promote delinquent behavior. For example, don't get mad, get even. There's a few other examples in in the book of that type of language. Peers may teach other kids to engage in crime through the reinforcements and punishments they provide for behavior. Crime is more likely to occur when A, uh, is frequently reinforced and infrequently punished. B, results in large amounts of reinforcement, for example, a lot of money, social approval, pleasure, and little punishment. And C, is more likely to be reinforced than alternative uh, behaviors. However, if an adolescent has a strong relationship with parents who teach morals and honesty, this influence will allow the child to avoid those peer influences that would lead to delinquent behavior. Social control theories under the social learning theory. Social control theory suggests that the strength and durability of an individual's bonds or commitments to conventional society inhibit delinquency. The need for belonging and attachment to others is fundamental, influencing many behavioral, emotional, and cognitive processes. Uh, Numerous studies highlight the association between attachments and positive youth outcomes. Early sociologists argue that the various forms of delinquency, including criminal behavior, emerge when the connections between individuals and the large society are weak. Sociologist Travis uh, Hirsky argued that the most important question is not why do they do it, i.e. why do criminals commit crime, but rather why do the rest of us not do it. Social control theories that offers this explanation, social bonds. When an individual's bonds to society are strong, they prevent or limit crime and other deviant behavior. When bonds are weak, they increase the probability of deviance. 
weak or broken bonds do not cause delinquency, but rather allow it to happen. Hirsky proposed four elements that help to shape the social bonds between individuals and their society. Attachment, commitment, belief, and involvement. Attachments uh, express, express concern about what others think or sensitivity to the opinion of others that would lead kids to avoid delinquency and negative behavior in order to avoid disappointing a respected individual or group, such as parents or teachers. Commitments, investment of time, energy, and oneself in a particular form of conventional activity and awareness that delinquent behavior would place such investment at risk. Involvements, sufficient time and energy is spent on conventional activities such that less time remains for delinquent behavior. And beliefs, the extent to which an individual has been socialized into and accepts the common belief system, assuming there is a common value belief system within a society or group. Uh, at, so for example, sensitive to other beliefs or respect for the law, if that's the norm in the common value system is there's respect for the law, that would be instilled uh, with regards to the socialized aspect of a common belief system. Uh, while there continues, there continues to be a debate relative to the strength or importance of any one of these particular elements of social bonds. The basic idea of social control theory, uh, as explained with social bonds, strongly supports this. And there's been decades of research that support uh, this tie to social bonds and delinquency. The strength of an individual's social bonds decreases the propensity for criminal or delinquent behavior. In other words, youth uh, are less attracted to criminal behavior when they are involved with others. They're learning useful skills. They're being rewarded for using those skills, enjoying strong relationships and forming attachments and earning the respect of their communities. As these social bonds become internal, they build social control which deters individuals from committing unlawful acts. And that is the social control theory. We turn now to the labeling theory. It's also called the social reaction theory. Uh, the strain, the social learning and social control theories, they focus on characteristics of juveniles and their environment. They describe how such characteristics lead juveniles to engage in delinquency. The labeling theory argues that juveniles become deviant as a result of others forcing that identity upon them. This process works because of stigma. In applying a deviant label, one attaches a stigmatized identity to the labeled individual. So the labeling theory focuses on the reaction to the delinquency, both the official reaction by the justice system and the informal reaction by parents, peers, teachers, and others. Labeling theory describes how the reaction to delinquency sometimes leads offenders to engage in further delinquency. What labeling theory does not do is try to explain the juvenile's initial acts of delinquency, the acts that resulted in the labeling. Rather, the theory tries to explain why some juvenile offenders are more likely than others to continue engaging in delinquency and perhaps move on to more serious delinquency. These initial acts may result in a label, such as delinquent, junkie, criminal, loser, while the initial act is important, it is the labeling process that transforms the adolescent's identity, ultimately stigmatizing him or her. So what effects does label labeling have? Perceived as a troublemaker, bad influence on siblings, schools may place uh, an individual juvenile in a separate class for students with behavioral problems. Neighbors may seek to avoid or tell their children to avoid this particular uh, adolescent. And as a result, an adolescent may seek peers with similar labels, depending on the behavior. This label could have a long-term effect 
they're unable to overcome it. They continue their juvenile behavior and they continue crime into adulthood. Official labeling is the result of official agencies like the police and the court's reaction to delinquency or a suspected delinquency. It is said that these agencies often view juvenile offenders as bad or dangerous and treat them in a harsh manner. And being treated harshly or rejected by these agencies has a negative effect. These agencies have a powerful effect over offenders and their actions, and they can have a major effect on juveniles. Research shows that contact with police early on leads to long-term labeling effects that can result in social problems, unemployment, and substance use. Being arrested also may lead parents, teachers, and the community to view and treat the uh, juvenile as a bad person, despite what that arrest was for. The arrest could have been for curfew or uh, being late and truancy, skipping school. These, th those are informal reactions, and they're just as important and more common. For example, the juvenile may not encounter the police every day, but has daily contact with their parents, teachers, etc. The negative views or harsh treatment from these sources create the labels. Once the label is instilled in the juvenile and is accepted by the juvenile, hence creating a new identity, I'm a juvenile, I'm a criminal, I'm a loser, I'm a nobody, the result is that they're expected to fail. And what happens? It creates a self-fulfilling prophecy. That completes our discussion on the social process theories. So let me do a recap checkpoint. Some experts believe that delinquency is a function of socialization. People in all walks of life have the potential to become delinquents if they maintain destructive social relationships with families, schools, peers, neighbors, etc. Social learning theory stresses that kids learn both how to commit crimes and the attitudes needed to support the behavior. People learn criminal behavior as much as they learn conventional behavior. Social control theory analyzes the failure of society to control antisocial tendencies. All people have the potential to become delinquents, but their bonds to conventional society prevent them from violating the law. Labeling theory maintains that negative labels produce delinquent careers. Labels create expectations that the labeled person will act in a certain way. Labeled people are always watched and suspected. So, so recap on our uh, social process theories. We have one more theory uh, to discuss. It's called the critical theory in our line of uh, sociological theories. The critical theory also tries to explain group differences in delinquency in terms of the larger social environment. Some focus on class differences, some on gender differences, and some on societal differences in crime. There are several versions of critical theory that exist, but all explain the crime in terms of group differences in power. And Again, a little later in the semester, we're going to talk about the uh, critical theory and, and gender. Um, but the, basically, what the critical theory stands for is that those who own the means of production in this country, factories, businesses, have the greatest power. This group the capitalist class or the elite class as it's referred to in the book uses its power for its own advantage the capitalists work for the passages the passage of laws that criminalize and severely sanction quote unquote the street crimes of lower class persons but ignore the mildly sanctioned uh, but they ignore or mildly sanction those harmful actions by business and industry i.e. our white-collar crimes, pollution, unsafe working conditions. 
and capitalists act to increase their profits, for example. They resist improvements in working conditions, and they attempt to hold down the wages of the workers. And as a result, there is a class conflict that is created. The main proposition under this view are uh, American societies based on an advanced capitalist economy. The state is organized to serve the interest of the dominant economic class, our elite class, our capitalist ruling class. Criminal law is the instrument of the state and ruling class used to maintain and perpetuate the existing social and economic order. Crime control in a capitalist society is accomplished through a variety of institutions and agencies established and administered by a government elite representing the ruling class interests for the purposes of establishing domestic order. The advancement of capitalism requires that the subordinate, subordinate classes remain oppressed by whatever means necessary, especially through coercion and then violence and the legal system. So, per this theory, crime and delinquency are the response to the conditions created by capital. As we discussed in an earlier chapter, the creation of delinquency and the involvement of the wealthy, powerful citizens played a critical role in shaping and forming the ju uh, juvenile justice system. It's believed that the child savings movements, their goals was to maintain order and control while preserving the elite, the elite class. These theories believe that capitalism is removing the youth from the labor force by replacing humans with machines, that schools groom the youth to conform to later job expectations, and those who do not conform in school are bound to wind up in delinquent roles, thereby affecting their status in society. We will discuss uh, other views under this theory when we discuss, uh, as I mentioned, gender and delinquency. In the next uh, section, we're going to discuss how these theories have impacted delinquency prevention uh, measures that are uh, in place and available for uh, juveniles.